Hello, Spark fans. Welcome back to Advancing Spark, where I want to talk about semantic models. Oh, it's a little break from the usual nerdery around Pi Spark and lakes and all that kind of stuff, because semantic models are a huge thing in the world of business intelligence and analytics, and we've been using them for decades. And suddenly, Databricks are coming out with unit catalog metric views, which are essentially semantic model baked into Databricks. But why should you care? Why does it matter? If you're a Spark developer, what does it matter to you? Why do you care where that semantic model is? Why start using one that's just come out as opposed to ones that have been around for a decade? That is what I want to talk about first. So we're going to do a couple of videos around uh, metric views and how they work and how to get started. But this first video, I'll show you what they are. I'll show you what you can do with them a little bit. But I mainly want to start with why? Why, why should you even care? So. If it's your first time around here, as always, don't forget to like and subscribe. And yeah, stick around for a quick tour of a decade of semantic models and then what unit catalog metric views actually are. Let's have a look. So, first things first, I even made some slides. Been consulting too much. I just like, how do I explain it? I need some slides. So, back in the day, why did we get semantic models in the first place? Well, the very first thing is just to hide away the complexity from business users. You got a bunch of tables. We followed our data architects instructions and give them a load of fairly complex convoluted naming conventions. This is actually a star schema, but I've got my F underscore D underscore. They're my facts and dimensions. But no one ever looks at those plain materialized tables because they go through a semantic model. So if I wanted to take something like that, some materialized table, and show it to some business users, I would make something pretty and go, hey, there you go, you guys go and look at that. So instead of FDW sales trans, I've just got sales, just look in, look in the sales bucket, find some things. Product and product cat, I've just combined into one nice clean product category dimension. My customer, I've just put in as customer, and actually the date table, I've got a really complex date table with all my different financial year metrics and the year number and the week number and all that kind of good stuff. But I don't want the business user to have to decide how to join to it. And, oh, I want to use it as the billing date or the shipping date or the purchase date, all these different things. It's a role-playing dimension. Just, I want to show them two things without duplicating the data underneath. I can do that via views. So essentially, it's just a little virtual model to make things easier for the business user to understand. That's where we started with the simplicity of semantic models. Now, that all changed when data got really big. We start doing, trying to do hard things with it. You know, way back, we started talking about cubes. Cubes exist across all sorts of different BI tools for doing this kind of thing. And essentially, it's, I want to do something that looks like a pivot table. I want to take, well, take this information, slice it by this information with the context of this information. Now tell me my figures. And that's fairly straightforward, but you get to a point where that's hard across a large amount of data. So... Take something super simple. I've got my days of the week, and then I've got my four different products, A, B, C, and D. Uh, and I'm trying to I'm trying to sell lots and lots of those things. I've got millions and millions of transaction on every day for every product. And for a client to quickly go and well, tell me how much I made for product A on Thursday, yeah, I can go and add up the millions and go, oh, okay, not those, not those, not those, not those. The answer is 350. Uh, or Actually, what happened with things like um, Microsoft's kind of uh, OLAP cubes, the MDX cubes, loads of kind of, you know, uh, Sybase cubes, various things across uh, time, they pre-calculated these things. So you pick a bunch of dimensions, you pick a bunch of these different cut and slice factors, you pick some measures, and it'll pre-calculate where possible. So things like just the sum of this, the count of this, how many of these events fit into that cross-tabulation of Thursday and A? Well, the answer is 350. So I could do that. And that made other things really, really easy. That's why cubes were great. So I could do things like say, well, just tell me how much money I made on Thursday. And I didn't have to pre-calc the whole of Thursday as a separate figure. I could just add up the four different subtotals I've got for my products. And I get to it way faster than I think of all the millions underneath. That's why MDX and OLAP cubes and all the other technology on a similar basis were so good. Do the same for product B and just say, just across all the weeks, I don't care. That's the basics of it, and that's just sheer performance. And honestly, things got to a point where the technology can kind of do this on the fly because tech's a lot better under the hood anyway. So that is less of an important thing. 
one of the more important concepts that came from this idea of these kind of like interrelated dimensional cells is the ability to then do comparisons. To go, well, I've got this cell, which is a pre calc of Friday of product D. What was it like last week? What was it like last year? What's the rolling average for it? So kind of being able to get these kind of hierarchical, positional, kind of um, interesting uh, time-based measures just became something that's really easy to do. Well, just have a year to date for this product. And just go back and find the cross tabulations that actually sit in that point of dimensionality and add those figures up. Now, that then became a thing that we then build in and we build logic around and we start to get the idea of KPIs built around these kind of uh, time-based temporal KPIs. So year to day, week to day, year, year on year. What is this period but last year at the same time? What's it of the last period, the last quarter, the last week, whatever that period is, what's the growth since then? What's the rolling average of the past 10 days? All of those kind of things are just now baked into semantic models in terms of quite easy functions. You could absolutely do it just writing pure SQL, but expecting your business users to write the SQL that has the context of what they're doing and change those views, they're not going to do it. So that's the challenge in terms of actually making, we've gone from, yeah, make it easy to understand to, oh, make it actually able to perform to, oh, a whole load of richness about these contextual measures. So a KPI that I cannot pre-calculate, something that, well, it depends on what you clicked on and what you filtered by and what other things you got sliced. There's a filter context in terms of the actual measure, which means it has to be calculated on the fly for the actual context of what I'm looking at but make it easy. That's where we got to with semantic models. But they're incredibly important and actually putting a huge amount of power at the hands of business users without this massive technical barrier. Now, that meant that these tools, tools that were actually providing a semantic model became incredibly sophisticated and mature. You know, Power BI and the tabular model been around for a decade? A long time. Mold. It all blurs into the past now. Now, that meant we have this kind of idea of I've got my data platform and I'm building everything in my data platform, I'm getting everything perfect in my data platform. And then I take my materialized data, my nice weirdly named tables, and I put that into a BI tool that has a semantic model in there because that's where the sophistication lives. That means that my KPI definitions, my, my measures, my important calculations upon which I'm running the business are pushed downstream into my BI tool. And that means my BI uh, users can then go and create their own reports. They can do self-serve analytics. It's a dream that people have been chasing to go. I just want everyone to do your own analytics. I don't, shouldn't have to teach you and do it for you. And incredible amounts of success from the good semantic models when that's done properly. Now, the problem is data platforms are getting way more sophisticated. You're getting loads of tools and features and things baked into the data platform itself. So when we're looking to say, well, actually now things like Databricks, I've got a bunch of out-of-the-box um, AI functions I can just call in SQL. But how do I do that if more of my KPIs live in an entirely different tool in a different language? Uh, conversational BI, AI BI Genie, the talk to your data is something so many people are trying to do. But then how do I talk to my data if the measures and metrics and things that my business users are talking, the lingua franca of business isn't held where Genie can see it? Well, that's not going to work very well. I'll have to redefine them. If I've got some data analyst trying to use Python and do some really interesting, sophisticated data modeling, but they don't have the pure definitions of how our business is ran, I end up having to have two copies. I've got the copy I keep down in my semantic model over in BI land, and I've got a copy I have to then keep in my data platform for other use cases. I've got to keep them in sync. They're not going to work the same because one's going to be this cross tabular context sensitive one. One's going to be hard coded in SQL somewhere. That just doesn't make sense. So that is why it's important to go and look. Well, Databricks are coming out. Obviously, Databricks have been pushing on AI BI dashboards and saying, hey, look, actually, Databricks is actually getting really, really good at analytics. Doing dashboards inside uh, in Databricks is something they want you to be able to go, yeah, it's a, it's a good option. It works. But there's table stakes. There's things that you need in order to be able to like actually call yourself a good analytics platform you need a semantic model for all of those reasons. You need a good cost filtering dashboard. You need all these different bits and pieces for that to even work. So yeah, that's what Unity Catalog metric views are. They're essentially saying, well, it's a semantic model. 
It's a chance for you to rename things so they're pretty for the business. A chance for you to give dimensionality and tell you what you can cross filter by and that structure things. A chance for you to define context sensitive, context filter uh, aware measures that you can then reuse across other BI tools and Genie and AI and this whole bunch of stuff. Now, there's a term that's very famous uh, in, in the Power BI realms of when you should you define logic, when should you define a measure. Roche's maxim of, well, define it as upstream as possible and as downstream as necessary. And essentially, Databricks coming out with Unity Catalog metric views is essentially just making it possible to define things even more upstream. Won't be popular with a lot of Power BI folks. And honestly, the maturity of your various different BI tools, semantic models are going to be way more mature the metric views when they first come out. But it's this starting stepping stone of a journey going, yeah, there's just so much more you can do if it is pulled upstream into your data platform. That is why we should care about Unity Catalog metric views. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to switch a little bit. I've talked about why, why you should care. Let's talk about actually what they are and where they live. Now, we're going to do more videos going into how you build them, how you define them, doing some interesting stuff with them. But just for a little a little taster, a little teaser, I'll just show you where they are and what they look like. So I've got one defined in here. I'm going to go and dig into this in a second. Well, I'm going to zoom in a little bit. Uh, I'm just going to grab gonna grab a random table. Fact delivery lines. Why not? Uh, and I can come in and go, I want to create a new metric view. So you can do it through the browser. You can do it through coding. The only interesting thing to be aware of when you do it through code is they are based in YAML. So it is a markup language. You're, you're declaring the various things and then you're pushing that uh, into Databricks to actually go and use. So I give that a second. There we go. So this is actually predefined a load of stuff for me. When MetroViews first came out in preview, it was like blank notebook. Off you go, write it all yourself. Now, because I've done this for Unity Catalog on top of an existing table, it's grabbed all of the straight dimensions. Now, these are all on that straight one table. It's expecting this is a single one big table style metric view, but saying, Here's all your different things that people are going to cut by. Here's your chance to rename it so it looks pretty for the business user. Essentially, if it's different words, put a space in there. Makes sense. So it just made it slightly nicer already without me having to go and do that. And then it's got a bunch of measures that's defined down at the bottom. I'm going to zoom in even more so you can see what that looks like. So it's assumed some measures. So it's gone, well, these all look like things you want to sum over. Let's just add all those bits in there. That looks like something you want to go to average. There's one you can't quite see down at the bottom. I'm going to bring that up a little bit. Whoops, there we go. Uh, it's got a sum down at the bottom, basically. You don't really care about that. Okay. Um, so that's that's like the starter point. So it's going to define this in YAML. We then click Create. It goes and creates that metric view. Now, if I go uh, back on this, I'm going to abandon that. I don't actually need to go and create that. It's not actually doing anything. If I dive back into the, here's one we made earlier kind of thing, and go say, actually, what does that look like? Um, we can go and see what is a... What is a metric view that we've done something interesting with look like? And there's a bunch of different ways we can actually go go and use it. So I've got a little our little kind of uh, retail CPG demo area. I've got my metric view that we've created. You can see there's a fairly nice UI these days. Now, last time I looked at this, it didn't have that. And you just got the YAML, pure and simple. Uh, but now I can see all the different metrics that have been created. I can actually go and edit it and add comments and start to do some nice uh, documentation of what my metric view is. And all the things we've got in here are fairly straightforward. I'm just doing some case statements so I can have it kind of only applying and only counting certain rows and cells inside of my things. I've got a few averages. I've got some some different things of the measures I want, might want to use. Then a bunch of dimensions across some different tables. So I am going to different tables in terms of here. I've got data in there, planned customers. So I've expanded from the straight one big table to actually something a little bit more like a star schema so we can go out and see more about it. And again, it's just a big old YAML view we've created, we've defined, we've hit go, and then that's now in there and saved. And the most important things being these KPIs, these measures that are now stored against that metric view can be then picked up and used in dashboards. They can be used in Genie spaces. They can be used in downstream BI tools. Just a load of extra things that we can do now that they're defined here inside Unity Catalog where I can secure them and treat them like an object. So I can go over and we've got a dashboard and that dashboard is using a metric view. So I can dive into one of these particular uh, things and say, what's this based on? Well, actually, this is using a measure 
And I can go and when I have a look at my various different fields, I've got my measures defined up top. Here's all the measures that are in that metric view. And then here's all the other fields that you've got as straight things, as dimensionality inside that metric view. So it's actually automatically picking out here with the measures, much like you'd see in a lot of semantic models you see in other tools. So again, this is all just, these are all based on that same metric view. And that does mean, you know, you just automatically get the cross slicing, click on one, it'll go and work on all the others. You know, you get the cross slicing automatically because they're based on the same thing. But rather than you having to try and get everything working on the same table, it's working on the same data model, working on the same data product. Just makes sense. Diving on the other side. Yeah, I've got a genie space. In the genie space, I've brought in a metric view. So that metric view is based on behind my genie space. And I get all my different measures in there. I've got my synonyms in there. I've got various different extra things I can do in there. Plus the dimension. So just automatically, all these things, all of these analytics artifacts are just switching from this view of going, I've got some tables and there might be a relationship between them doing, oh yeah, this is a data product that has measures. It's got KPIs in there. It's got joins I've programmed. It's got the ability to work in this. I can treat the whole thing like a data product. That is actually my window into my whole data model is now that metric view. It's pretty cool. So that, that is all I want to show you today. All I want to show you is just that first little taster of going, this is what they're for. They're for exposing as the, the definitive answer to that data product out to the business that is then exposed through Genie Spaces, through dashboards, through downstream Power BI tools, through AI use cases, through whatever you need to use that data for. Go through that metric view. Essentially, now we're going to get to the point in Databricks, the, what if I finished building a new use case? Oh, well, it's when the metric view is there. It's, yeah, I can get it through bronze, silver, gold, etc. The view that people use to have a look at what's in gold is going to be this metric view. And again, they're in public preview currently. There is still things that we are missing that we'd want to see. Some of the more really kind of advanced, wacky use cases you'd get in sophisticated uh, semantic models, they're probably not in there yet. But direction of travel, in terms of why we should care, why this is important, there's loads in there, which we're going to see more and more use cases coming for. So we've got a few blogs, we've got a few examples, we've got some stuff coming. We have loads of plans over the next month or so. So we'll be sharing more examples and we'll go through how you build a more detailed one, some complex examples and lots of good stuff like that. Stay tuned. But for now, yeah, I just start to get a little bit excited. Cool. That's all for me. As always, don't forget to like and subscribe and I'll catch you next time. Cheers.